Welcome everyone. We're gonna give people a few minutes to join. So I appreciate your patience um, and hope that you are doing well. Nice to see so many friends joining us from Indonesia, Nigeria, St. Lucia. Welcome. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. Welcome to our friends from China and India. Nice to see you people. We really have uh, folks from all over the world joining us today. This is very exciting. Yeah, it's great, <laughs> and especially for those who are waking up early, early in the morning or late at night. We really appreciate it. Oh, and Romania. I have fond memories of working in Romania at one point. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, it's just six o'clock. We'll wait another one minute until a few more people can join and then we'll start. Greetings, our friends from Kenya and from Syria. Welcome to our, our colleague from Ethiopia. Nice to see you all. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started now. So welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar on managing the inventory of cold chain equipment. This is Greg Roche, and I'm here again with my colleague, Barbara Lamphier, and we're both very happy to be with you to present today's topic. We also wanna take this opportunity to wish everyone a very happy new year. We're a little bit into the, to the year, uh, but we really uh, welcome you all and wish you very much success during the year. So Barbara, could you please introduce yourself? Hello everyone, this is Barbara Lamphiers. I'm a senior technical advisor with JSI and I've been working in supply chain management for more than 30 years across a variety of programs, including immunization programming and in many of your countries. Um, and it's so exciting to see such a broad range of people joining us today. Great, thanks. And I'm Greg Roche. I've been in supply chain for about 20 years and more broadly in the areas of education, organizational and professional development for about 30 plus years, let's say. Um, my supply chain experience is varied depending on the assignment from assessing logistics systems to designing logistics systems. And most recently I've been involved in the, 
design or redesign and optimization of vaccine supply chains in a couple of countries. And so again, it's very nice to be with you. We want to welcome back anyone who's been participating in previous immunization supply chain webinars. And we also want to take this opportunity to welcome anyone who's joining us for the first time. We're also very pleased to announce Matt Morio. He will be joining us uh, with some information on some immunization supply chain, cold chain equipment uh, planning tools. Uh, and I'm going to ask Matt, could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Morio. I work with PATH uh, out of Seattle, Washington, USA. Uh, my experience has been just under 20 years in medical and pharmaceutical supply chain. And my focus at PATH is primarily around immunization supply chain, as well as cold chain equipment planning, forecasting, and um, evaluations. Glad to meet you all. Great. Thanks very much and welcome again, Matt. It's really glad to, uh, we're really glad to have you with us. So this is the fifth and the final webinar in our series of ensuring a responsive immunization supply chain. We have already covered the topics of immunization supply chain design, including tools, and preparing the supply chain for new vaccine introduction. And during this webinar, we will cover our last topic in the series. And of course, it's managing the inventory of cold chain equipment. You may also remember in a previous webinar series on supply chain leadership last year, we presented a webinar that covered some of the basics of cold chain equipment. We had wanted to include today's topic during that earlier webinar, but with the amount of information to present during that webinar, it was not possible. So we can consider this webinar to be a follow on and building on the discussion that we had during that previous webinar. We will share, of course, the links to the previous webinars in this series and the previous cold chain equipment webinar in the follow up email communication after this webinar. As we get started, we want everyone to introduce himself or herself. A lot of you have already been doing that. Uh, please use the chat function for introducing yourself in Zoom. And as always, we hope to take questions at the end of the presentation. And so if you do have a question at any time during the presentation or towards the end, you can use the Q&A button found at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your question. And please, for questions, do not use the chat function. So now let's get started. Let's look at the objectives for this webinar on cold chain equipment management. We'll start by talking about potential process activities for planning for cold chain equipment needs. Then we'll look at a system for managing our cold chain equipment. We'll look at the kinds of information and data that we will need to manage our cold chain inventory. And finally, we will provide a quick overview of some tools that are available to help us facilitate the management of our cold chain equipment inventory. We really do want to mention and highlight and recognize WHO, UNICEF, PATH, and Village Reach, because a lot of the content for this webinar was adapted from resources and information that they make available on the internet. The presentation and interpretations of the information are ours, and if we do happen to misunderstand something, it is our mistake and not theirs. Please feel free to comment on anything related using the Q&A function during the webinar. And again, as our usual approach, we'll say this several times as a reminder, we'll share the full references and links at the end of the webinar so you can refer directly to the source information that we are using. I'm sure everyone's eager to get started, so let's do. Let's tackle our first objective by looking at various types of cold chain equipment that are needed to properly handle the cold chain products for our immunization program. Here is an example cold chain showing representations of equipment at each level, large walk-in freezers and cold rooms at the central level, 
refrigerator freezers at the regional level, perhaps smaller refrigerators and freezers at the district level, and various cold boxes or other appropriate cold chain equipment at the health center or service delivery point level. You can also have cold chain equipment at smaller health posts and possibly even at the community level as well. Keep in mind that these are just representations and the actual equipment found at different levels would be appropriate for the kind of cold storage that is needed. So the question for us is first, how do we plan our cold chain equipment needs? How to decide what cold chain equipment goes at each level or each facility? The choice of cold chain equipment per facility will be based on a combination of various factors. One of the primary factors will be the volume of products that will be stored at the facility based on consumption, buffer stock, and resupply intervals. The more you need to store at any given time, the larger capacity will, you will require. You will also need to consider which facilities are distributing or administering which vaccines. Do they require frozen storage or only cold storage? and what storage temperatures are required. You can also consider how long the vaccines will be stored before they are used. If a worker is taking a small quantity into the community to do home-based immunization, then perhaps they only need a small vaccine carrier with ice packs or cold, cool water packs. You would also of course, need to consider the cost of the equipment, including the cost to purchase the equipment, the cost to operate the equipment, and the cost to maintain the equipment. Aside from maintenance cost, you will also consider other factors related to maintenance, such as how frequently the cold chain equipment needs to be serviced and who is qualified to do the servicing. You will need to consider the source of energy required to run the equipment. If electricity from the electric grid is a problem, then you would at least need a backup generator and the size and type of generator will need to be appropriate for the size and type of equipment being run, as well as the average length of time for blackouts. You might be able to use solar if the available equipment can maintain the appropriate temperatures for the expected time period that the products will be in storage. And of course, if sunlight is sufficient to keep the batteries charged. If solar equipment is not appropriate in terms of storage temperature or size, then you might have to consider using a generator as your main power supply or using petrol or other fuel powered equipment. You will also need to consider reliability of the cold chain equipment. What is the expected usable life of the product? If you have experience with a product that in practice is less reliable than stated due to your climate or other factors, then you would need to reconsider purchasing that same equipment in the future. Also keep in mind that WHO and others produce recommended standards for cold chain equipment. So you would want to ensure that cold chain equipment you are purchasing adheres to those standards. So the process for planning your cold chain equipment is relatively straightforward. You determine all these factors for each facility and then procure and install the appropriate equipment. But I'm sure it sounds easier than it is. In addition to the factors that we have just mentioned, such as volumes, costs, energy requirements, and so on, we will also want to consider the benefits of standardization. Remember, that the less variety you have in your cold chain equipment, the easier it will be to manage maintenance and spare parts, for example. You might also be able to negotiate better pricing on larger quantities of cold chain equipment being procured. So you would likely want to try to standardize on one type of walk-in cold room and one type of walk-in freezer and then one or two types of solar refrigerator and so on. You don't necessarily need to have every facility using the same equipment, but you would definitely want to minimize the amount of variety you have amongst your various cold chain equipment as demonstrated here. Keep in mind that you might have to choose, for example, 
to install cold chain equipment with a slightly larger capacity than is actually needed in order to achieve the same level of standardization. So you might end up installing five cubic meter refrigerators throughout a set of facilities rather than having some with four cubic meters and some with five cubic meters. Well, like, while this might seem wasteful, remember that any possible higher purchase price could result in other savings over time. So keep in mind that what you might see as excess capacity could also be exploited. For instance, you can optimize the use of those cold chain equipment by shifting delivery frequency or integrating other non-vaccine cold chain products into the cold chain. If you already have a variety of cold chain equipment in your system, then you could still look at transitioning, transitioning to more standardized cold chain equipment as part of your equipment replacement program or when expanding the number of immunization sites. Great, so now let's consider that we have our cold chain equipment installed and we have had a chance to do some standardization. Now let's think about an overall system that we might want to use to manage our cold chain equipment over time. The content we are presenting is based on information found in the WHO Vaccine Management Handbook and in related materials developed by UNICEF. The handbook and the other materials will be among the resources that we will share with you after the webinar. As identified in the WHO handbook and reflected in this diagram, we have to account for a variety of maintenance activities, including inspection and preventive maintenance, as well as corrective maintenance. Preventive maintenance should be done by staff on a regular basis such as a healthcare worker at a facility cleaning the cold chain equipment and defrosting it. For solar panels, preventive maintenance would include things like cleaning any dust or dirt from the panels and removing tree branches that hang over the solar panels and block the sun. Corrective maintenance would cover actual repairs that need to be performed as a result of damage or use, such as if a connecting wire gets disconnected or a leaking battery requires replacement, or if you need to replace the temperature gauge, for example. Compared to preventive maintenance, corrective maintenance typically requires a technician to be involved. Related to this, we also need to specify who is responsible for the various types of maintenance. For example, will repairs be handled in-house by a team from the EPI program that is trained to do maintenance and repairs, or will technicians be hired, either through a long-term contract or through ad hoc hiring? Here we can see the recommended contents of a well-designed, well-written, and well-managed Standard Operating Procedure, or SOP. The SOP should cover what policy the SOP refers to, what activities are involved within the SOP and when they should be done, who should be implementing the procedure? Are there any related equipment or SOPs applicable to the implementation of this procedure? And then the actual procedure using step-by-step -step instructions. Finally, we also need to keep in mind the process that we will use for updating the SOP. Superseded versions of any SOP should be withdrawn and replaced with a new version. To manage your updates, you probably want to keep the SOP in a binder that has replaceable pages rather than a bound version or a full printed document that would need to be reprinted in its entirety each time there is a change to one procedure. A well-designed cold chain equipment management system will also include procedures to implement in cases where something goes wrong with our cold chain equipment, so a contingency plan. For instance, if a cold chain equipment breaks down, then there should be a procedure for alternate short-term storage while the cold chain equipment is being repaired, such as temporarily storing products in an appropriate short-term storage equipment, moving your products from a refrigerator to cold box, for example, or moving the products to a nearby facility that has an appropriate working cold chain equipment 
with sufficient spare capacity. Contingency plans must be documented and known ahead of time so that they can be implemented as soon as any problems arise. As we mentioned earlier, we will need some type of reporting system to gather information on a regular basis. How regularly the data is collected will be determined by how often the data or information is needed for decision making. Our reporting system would have a number of elements, including those listed here. Each type of information will be used for specific purposes, such as monitoring the current situation or planning for the future. In a moment, we will see some of the specific data and information requirements. In other words, what specific data and information should be collected by the various inventories, records, and so forth. In general, we also need to keep in mind that our reporting system, in addition to providing information to generally manage our cold chain equipment, also needs to provide data that will enable us to assess performance indicators related to our cold chain equipment, such as percent downtime per cold chain equipment type or model, percent variance in temperatures, and so on. Aside from things like the SOPs and contingency plans and reporting systems, we also need the actual resources, such as those that are shown here, in order to do equipment maintenance and manage our system. We need trained personnel, we need financing to pay for spare parts, repairs and printing, or electronic distribution of our reports and so forth. We will be looking at a number of specific tools that are useful for helping to manage various aspects of our cold chain equipment inventory and our program. But we do want to mention now a few comprehensive reference materials that we will also share with you after the webinar. From WHO, there is how to develop and repair, uh, sorry, how to develop a repair and maintenance system for cold chain equipment which is the one that we used to adapt the content we were just presenting. And also from WHO, there is effective vaccine management model standard operating procedures, consolidated version with a user guide. Also from PATH, Gavi and Village, Village Reach, there is a resource titled, Improving the Quality and Accuracy of National Cold Chain Equipment Inventory Data. And again, we'll share links with, to all of these after the webinar. Let's now think about the information that we will need related to our program and our cold chain equipment in order to manage our cold chain equipment inventory. Essentially, this will be information and data that we need in order to implement the processes we have just been talking about. We've already seen a lot of data and information that we need in order to select our cold chain equipment. And we will certainly need to track and monitor this same data over time as part of our overall management of our cold chain equipment and our cold chain. But let's look at some of these in a little bit more detail and related to the management and monitoring of our cold chain equipment. For each data element or type of information that we talk about, we will need to consider the different vaccines and immunization activities, such as those listed here. We need to know about the vaccines that will be managed on an ongoing basis via regular resupply through our supply chain, as well as any campaigns that will be organized and any extra surge capacities in cold chain equipment that might be needed. We also need to consider supplementary activities, such as when COVID-19 vaccines are rolled out. That will likely be a special case of new vaccine introduction with wider total population vaccine vaccinations. And if new products are coming into the system, we need to know when they will be coming so that we can prepare in advance, such as installing new cold chain equipment that might be needed or adjusting delivery schedules. We mentioned earlier that the volumes of vaccines to be managed is key to planning our cold chain equipment. And that remains true as we monitor and evolve over time. One set of data that 
will be crucial is the data required to do a reliable quantification of vaccine quantities and volumes that will be managed in our system. This will first be based on our forecasted consumption quantities of each vaccine. We can do this using, among others, historical logistics data and demographic and other program data. We will also need to track open and closed vial wastage and use this data to adjust forecast or procurement quantities. It may also lead us to procuring smaller vials of products to reduce wastage. Looking to the future, we will also want to consider some demographic data based on target populations. Demographic data will be particularly relevant in the introduction of a new vaccine when we will not have historical consumption data. We list some of the demographic factors that you will need to take into account here. We need to understand also how, as, how the program is planning to evolve over time. Will the vaccine services be expanded? Will more healthcare providers be trained to administer vaccines? And if so, what impact will that, this have on consumption or usage? Once we have forecasted consumption for each vaccine and the related consumables, we then take into account other supply chain and commodity data related to the quantities we will actually procure and, in our, and we'll have in our pipeline in, at any given time. So for example, we would need to know our stock on hand and on order, supplier lead times, and other supply chain data as listed here. Related to the quantities, we need to understand the volumes of products that we will be receiving. Again, the quantities and related volumes that we will be procuring will help us assess the types and number of cold chain equipment that will be required for storage and transportation of the vaccines that we will be managing in our system. Generally, these data would also need to be disaggregated by cold chain temperature and levels in the system. In terms of how we use this data, our cold chain equipment needs may increase over time due to larger volumes being procured and distributed. So we may need to plan for additional equipment purchases, even more cold chain equipment at a site or replacing smaller cold chain equipment with larger capacity cold chain equipment. We also need to other, understand the other information related to vaccines and cold chain equipment as those listed here on this slide. So for the data re related to um, our actual cold chain equipment, we want to track identifying information and the basic equipment characteristics for our cold chain equipment at each facility, as, as you see here on this, on this list. Most of these will remain constant once the cold chain equipment is installed, so you probably don't need to have people report this information each month, for example. One exception could be would be actually the status of the cold chain equipment. If it has changed from working to broken, you would want to have that information as soon as possible. On the other hand, some of the information shown here, you would want to update on a regular basis, such as spare parts used, problems, and the number of repairs performed during, um, during the period. Information such as cost effectiveness would perhaps be done through an annual survey. You would also want to have some of the information by facility. So these data items listed here would be those that you would want to have by facility. Okay, great. So we've seen dozens and possibly hundreds of data items and different information that we would need to have and monitor in order to effectively manage our cold chain equipment and our vaccines, of course. As we go through these tools, one important thing to keep in mind is that updating the cold chain inventory should be done regularly and can be done through the regular reporting or LMIS. It doesn't have to be an activity where you drop everything and spend hundreds or thousands of dollars to do an activity to update the inventory. Any ELMIS should be able to do this systematically. And even paper reporting could capture the information if it is done correctly and thoughtfully. 
The most important thing to remember is that we need to collect and have the information at the times when we are making our specific decisions. If we're doing an annual procurement plan for cold chain equipment, we might not need to collect certain information on a monthly basis, for example. So now let's review some of the tools that are available that can help us to manage our cold chain equipment and the related data and information. There are many tools available through the internet, partner websites, and so on, so we will cover just a few examples here. But remember, we will also distribute templates or examples of these and links to other tools among the resources we share after the webinar. Actually, before we get started, it will be interesting to do a little poll. So we'd like to find out from all of you some information about tools that you might have or use to manage your cold chain equipment or your uh, vaccine uh, program. So you see a list here of some different tools. We have the cold chain inventory uh, gap analysis tool. We have the vaccine volume calculator. We have an EPI logistics forecasting tool. I see people already voting, that's excellent. We have the CCEOP. We have standard operating procedures manual that we talked about earlier. We have job aids and we have other. So these are some of the potential tools that you might have and use. And please go ahead and click any or all that apply for you. Take a minute and we will look at the results shortly. Looks like about half the people have voted. Let's take another 30 seconds. Okay, another 10 seconds. Five seconds. Okay, apologies if you haven't been able to answer. We're going to end the poll now and we'll take a look at the results. It looks like about 65 or 66 people have, uh, have voted. Uh, or indicated. And so let's have a look at these quickly, uh, the results. And so, look, wow, those SOP manuals, about 70% of those voted, uh, those who voted or, or indicated uh, have, are using standard operating procedures manuals. And we talked about how key that is for the management of your program. So that is great. And then we also see about half of the people who indicated have used the cold chain inventory analysis, gap analysis tool the EPI logistics forecasting tool and the CCEOP. Those are the top, um, top uh, ones that, are, um, that have been indicated as being used. So that is great. And uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for sharing that information. So let's go ahead now and look at some of the tools that we might have. So first, we're going to look at a few tools that are based on Excel spreadsheets. Most people know how to use Excel, and you're familiar with that. So the first one is one that we mentioned, and we'll actually, we mentioned all of these, but we'll go through them one by one. This is a tool that's developed by WHO. It's called the Cold Chain, inventory, uh, Cold Chain Equipment Inventory Gap Analysis Tool. And you see some screenshots that are here on the, on the presentation. In the middle, you can see the tabs show different kinds of data and information that are gathered in the tool, such as program data, facility data, and commodity inventory data. The tool produces graphs and indicates, as shown in the screenshot at the bottom of your screen, the gap analysis related to different aspects of the cold chain and cold chain equipment. The example that we can see here shows the distribution of functional status, so you would be able to see at a glance what percent of your cold chain equipment is functional, non-operational, missing, or so on. This screenshot shows an example output graph. 
It's showing distribution of service points by electrification status, the hours of electricity. There are additional graphs that show distribution of cold chain equipment by functional status, cold chain equipment by age of the equipment, and many others. As we said earlier, the volume of vaccines moving through the cold chain is a key driver in the eventual cold chain equipment requirements for purchase and so on. The vaccine volume calculator is used to estimate the net volume of vaccines and related supplies at each level in the supply chain. It can be used to estimate the type of cold chain equipment needed for a specific target population. The effect of new vaccine introductions can be tested by comparing one or more of these against the current schedule. We will provide the links to the tool and user guide in the follow-up to the webinar. And here are some of the sample graphs that the vaccine volume calculator produces. Here is a simple spreadsheet from UNICEF that helps to organize and catalog some of the basic cold chain equipment inventory information that we mentioned earlier, such as facility information, the name and type, the population served, immunization services offered, and the resupply intervals, and then cold chain equipment information, the type of equipment, the manufacturer, model, serial number, and so forth. Here is another cold chain inventory format used by MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières. In addition to what you see in the screenshot, there are sections on the freezers, the brand and the model and so forth, the transport equipment that your system uses in your cold chain, vaccine carriers, cold boxes, ice packs, etc., and the different monitoring equipment that you might use, such as temperature loggers, thermometers, freeze indicators, and so on. Let's now come and get some information from Matt, our guest speaker, to hear about a tool called the ODK-X, which I believe is a tool that has a function similar to the cold chain equipment inventory tools that we have just seen. Matt? Thank you, Greg. Um, so the ODK-X cold chain equipment inventory application is a Android-based tool that will allow users to have a real-time and, and live view of your, your inventory data. Um, a lot of the tools we have just seen have the data stored in spreadsheets and is kind of a, a process to collect and enter. This puts all that data at your fingertips to be updated and visible um, in near real-time with the ability to work offline as well. Uh, it's an open source tool that has been piloted in several countries so far, and we are in the process of working with the University of Washington here in Seattle to um, allow more deployments within uh, more countries for that. So the screenshots that we have on screen right now are just some general screens about the, the type of information within the, the application, which includes facility information and GPS. Uh, the different types, as well as the equipment itself um, and where the equipment is stored, as well as functional status. And the next slide, I think, will show us some of the more detailed information. One of the nice things about having uh, an active cold chain inventory is that we can not only see the functional status of the equipment um, and know where and how to respond, but we can also log maintenance logs and repair logs up for the, the equipment as well um, digitally. So within ODKX cold chain equipment inventory app, we can do three types of maintenance logs, a repair, a preventative, or a miscellaneous other. These are important so that we can show that we are doing our routine maintenance and having records of that for warranty needs or just general maintenance um, and management tools with cold chain technicians. And then the repair logs are important to collect information on equipment performance and what's being done to repair them. 
as well as eventually, hopefully we will have a spare parts inventory module so that we can view what spare parts are available and where they're located to better manage the cold chain the equipment uh, down the stream. This is a um, being scaled up in, in Uganda right now and it's being piloted in three other countries. So if you would like more information, please feel free to email me at, at the email on the slide. Um, and I believe Greg and Barbara will be sharing that in the uh, information package after this conversation. Thanks, Greg. Okay, great. Thanks, Matt. And yes, we will be sharing the information and please be ready for a deluge of emails from our participants. <laughs> So let's go, let's continue to the next one. So we want to look briefly at the EPI logistics forecasting tool. That's another WHO tool that's related to vaccine and cold chain equipment management. It's a multi-tab spreadsheet that helps to organize and catalog very detailed information and data that you need to do your forecast quantities, cold chain capacity, and other parameters. This table shows just a few of the examples of types of data that are collected. And we will also see some of the outputs that the tool uh, produces using the data and the information that you present. Uh, sorry, that you enter. And so here's an example graph. This one shows, uh, it's an example of the kind of outputs from this tool. And in this case, we see an evolution of the equipment costs over the next several years based on the data that you input into the tool about vaccines managed and type of cold chain equipment that you need. So let's go back to Matt now for some information about another tool that's called the total cost of ownership tool. So Matt, now that we know, or we imagine that we know our cold chain equipment needs, having used the other tools that we have presented, how do you select or evaluate your equipment? Thanks, Greg. As you mentioned, the, the total cost of ownership tool is really to help uh, programs and countries understand and evaluate different options out there. This is one of the requirements of the Gavi CCEOP applications, um, and it's available in, in the links you'll share, but we, it's a tool that is available with Excel version, which has a lot more customization uh, of different assumptions. And then we also have a, a simpler version online, which is what the screenshot here is. Uh, the URL for that is coldchaintco.org, and we'll share that again. But the, the goal of this is to allow users to evaluate the different types of technology, be it solar direct drive, mains powered, passives, et cetera, uh, the different types of equipment, as you can see in the middle, as well as different uh, volume segments. So you can, can kind of compare the different equipment uh, next to each other. As, as you know, the purchase price does not necessarily represent the total cost of operating in a piece of equipment. Um, so this tool helps to visualize and explain some of the, the variances between them. Uh, as well as the warranties and, and things like that. Uh, the next slide will show a, a brief output of this comparing some solar direct drives to other technologies such as kerosene and gas. Um, so the blue portion would be the, the cost of the equipment uh, and the installation. And then the or green, lighter green would be the, the cost to operate that. So for the example, the, the kerosene, while all those price of those, those uh, absorption refrigerators may be lower, we're spending almost the same amount, if not more, in the operation of the, the cost for the fuel. Um, and that doesn't even include some of the, the transportation to get the fuel to the facility. Uh, but again, this tool is, is helpful for evaluating it and understanding the equipment once you have assessed your needs. Um, and it's available uh, via the website that we'll share in the, the packet. Back to you, Greg. Okay, thanks. And so we'll see the CCEOP in just a moment and talk very briefly about that. But Matt, is there anything else that you want to tell us about the total cost of ownership tool? I, I, you know, there's one thing that is, it's always evolving. We're updating it with the, the latest WHO pre PQS pre-qualified equipment um, each quarter. If you do have questions, you can always reach out to, to my email, which was shared in there or info at path.r, uh, sorry, I don't have that email, but um, 
my email and, and we can help you with that. The, the Excel version is also much more rich in terms of functionality and, and tailoring your assumptions for local power rates or um, labor rates, et cetera. So uh, we're happy to, to walk you through that. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, Matt. And again, as you mentioned earlier, we will be sharing the, these links with you after the webinar. So we just mentioned the CCEOP. Matt mentioned that the tool he presented is required under the CCEOP. So let's have a brief overview of that tool. Uh, here's an example of the CCEOP spreadsheet. CCEOP, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is the Cold Chain Equipment Operational Plan. This is used and recommended by Gavi and UNICEF. It catalogs a wide range of information, including facility information, and then other information related to things such as site accessibility, such as the distance to a site, the road quality, and so forth. The readiness of the site to have cold chain equipment, what type of roof do they have, maybe if they have uh, electricity or not, existing cold chain equipment, if any. It also can catalog information about training. Have people received training on preventive maintenance, operational training, and so on. The CCEOP is used to help manage our cold chain equipment, including purchases and other aspects of cold chain equipment management. Another simple spreadsheet for calculating, for cataloging, excuse me, for cataloging information related to cold chain equipment repairs and, equi uh, and maintenance is shown here. It's a simple repair and maintenance record. Related to the repair and maintenance record or activity, the cold chain equipment spare parts record is another simple spreadsheet for cataloging information related to cold chain equipment spare parts. Uh, and here is a, a master list. It's like a master stock card for our uh, spare parts. Now let's look at a couple of paper-based tools. Of course, some of the Excel tools that you just looked at could also be printed out and managed on paper. One important tool or resource that every immunization program should have is the Standard Operating Procedures Manual or Guide for Cold Chain Equipment. And we've already talked about that a bit. And it can include the content that is seen here and we looked at a little earlier. These would be the sections of the SOP manual. Here's some extracts from an SOP template for effective vaccine management that was developed by WHO. And we will share the word-based template with you after the webinar. So if you are in the process of, of updating or developing an SOP manual, this might be useful to you. You can also think about job aids for the workers at all levels. Job aids that help people follow and implement the procedures that are in the SOP manual. Here's an excerpt of an example of a simplified job aid developed by UNICEF for cold chain equipment use and maintenance that can provi be provided to healthcare workers or to cold chain equipment um, maintenance staff. So it's often useful to have these job aids for use right on the job and when re easy reference is needed. Here is an excerpt of another job, example job aid format, again, related to maintenance, but this time it's more in a checklist format rather than a, a picture um, procedures format. And here are some additional resources that are found on, that we found online and we will be sharing with you after the webinar, some um, monitoring, uh, temperature monitoring charts. I'm sure many of you have examples that you could share contingency plan template and equipment technical sheets that are useful for people working and maintaining the cold chain equipment. All right, great. So thank you very much, um, Barbara and Matt. This is the end of the technical portion of our webinar. Today, we have described a process for planning cold chain equipment needs. We described a system for managing cold chain equipment. We listed some information and data that you need when managing the inventory of cold chain equipment. And we identified some tools to facilitate the management of our cold chain equipment inventory. We do have some time to address some questions that have come in. So let's turn our attention to the Q&A list that we've been receiving. And thanks to everyone who's been submitting. I'm going to 
go for some low hanging fruit to start. Um, the first question I'll look at, uh, what is the appropriate temperature for COVID-19 vaccine? That is a <laughs> very uh, important question these days. And I believe the different vaccines have uh, the ones that are approved and that are currently being used have different requirements, but I believe they all need uh, very cold, like I think one of them is like minus 50 degrees Celsius or something, <laughs> and then it require a cold chain. I don't know if Barbara. So the so enough. the Pfizer vaccine, <laughs> yeah. Pfizer is, is negative 72, um, and then the um, Moderna vaccine is um, two to eight degrees Celsius, more like our normal cold chain um, requirements for other for other vaccines. I'm not familiar with the other with vaccines that are being used. Um, in other countries that um, I'm not sure what's being, but if anybody wants to add anything in the in the chat about the vaccines that may be being used in your country right now, um, the AstraZeneca vaccine also has more normal re cold re requirements, cold chain, more like the two to eight degrees Celsius requirements. So, um, but I don't, I'm not, familiar with the like the Sino vaccine requirements, not up to date on that. So if anybody has that information, I know we have some colleagues from, from China on this um, webinar, so feel free to type it either in the chat or in the Q&A section, so. Okay, great. Let me do a couple of questions in rapid succession. There is one question about maintenance and inspections. Is there a tool where the inspection is detailed? You actually saw Barbara presented uh, some of the job aids. Oh, uh, two of the job aids that she showed are specific to the process for doing and the, the steps that you would go through to do uh, the inspection. So what are you looking at for the inspection? Does it pass inspection um, and so forth? And we'll share that with you. You'll have that as an example. Um, are there any tool versions in Spanish? In the research that we were doing, I did not find any. I don't know if Barbara or Matt would like to comment. I believe when you go on the WHO part, they have some different languages. Uh, sorry, some of their tools are available in different languages, but I don't specifically recall hearing about or seeing a Spanish link. It's possible and likely for WHO because they're so international. I don't know, Barbara or Matt, do you know? Uh, are you aware of any specific ones that are in Spanish? I believe the, the like you said, Greg, the WHO tools have a, a Spanish version for some of them. The PATH tools we have currently are in French and English, um, but the, and the ODK tool itself is currently English only, but it's easy to add translation um, as we deploy further. Okay, perfect. Barbara, anything else? No, I don't know anything else other than I, I believe almost all the WHO thing, um, tools are available in, in Spanish, English, and French. So, Yeah, and actually that reminds me, in one of the tools that we presented, and I'm sorry, I don't remember which one specifically, but there is a tab inside the tool that gives translations. And so it'll have one column in English and then there's about three or four other columns. So likely one of those is gonna be Spanish. I apologize, I don't remember the specific tool, but it's, you'll see it when you, uh, when you get the links. Um, another question, uh, are, there, are, are these tools online or offline? Is it possible to get consolidated data at the national level? You'll have to look at those uh, and determine that for yourself. I apologize. I didn't notice that the tools, it, to me, they look more like data collection tools and data aggregation tools. I, and I don't remember seeing any that were specifically networked. I don't know, Matt, are the two that you presented? Are those like the Android one? I think it must be that you can collect the data and see it at the highest level, something like that. Yeah, so the most of the forecasting and costing tools, like you mentioned, Greg, are Excel based, so they would all be offline um, and, and you can do the reporting within any laptop. The co total cost of ownership tool is Excel based as well as the the online version. So there are both of those. Um, but again, that is only for just understanding and, and under map evaluating equipment. The ODKX inventory application is 
both online and, and offline. It, it syncs the data when there is internet available, either through Wi-Fi or uh, mobile cellular devices, um, but it allows for offline operation as well, but it does require internet at some point to sync all the data. Thank okay, you. great. Acknowledge that thank you to the, our colleagues that are adding to the chat. Um, one of our colleagues has about the storage temperature for, for um, the Sinovac, which is the um, vaccine found in China, is also two to eight degrees Celsius, um, like the Moderna and, and um, AstraZeneca vaccine. So I think, um, thank you for that contribution. Um, there was another comment in the chat that says, none of the tools provide all the information needed and using many tools sometimes proves difficult. Um, I don't know, Matt or anybody else want to comment on, um, or Greg, you want to comment on, on this sort of siloing of these tools or if any of the, what, which tools you think are the most comprehensive or, and, and therefore fewer tools are needed? I know that's probably part of the reason you, Matt, you all were de developed your tool is to make it a little bit more easy. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. It, it, it is challenging and it, I think it's, it really relates to the process or, or where you are in your, your cold chain equipment planning. You know, the inventory um, is the backbone of all of that. You know, we need to know what exists before we can understand what our needs are. Um, and so having a, a good inventory using some of the tools that, that Greg and Barbara have outlined is, is a great first step. And then understanding what, what our growth is, what our new vaccines to be introduced, et cetera, to see what our storage capacity needs are. Um, I saw there was another question about that. And so some of the, the WHO tools will help understand that the volume needs that you'll need per facility, et cetera. Um, and, and then, you know, moving on and, and, and updating the inventories is, is the other biggest challenge, I think. Um, Sometimes we do these inventories for applications like CCEOP or reporting um, and they become quickly outdated. So understanding and having a resource and training and B budget to maintain your cold chain equipment inventory is, is I think crucial so that it can make this a more dynamic and um, managerial process versus um, just collecting data and, and putting it someplace. Yeah, absolutely. We, we emphasize and mentioned several times, we only want to collect information if we're using it for making decisions. And so, of course, there is lots of decisions, which means lots of data. And then, as we said, we want to try to try to uh, collect and manage that data. Um, we have just a couple more minutes. I The first question that was was uh, submitted in the Q&A, I didn't mean to uh, to skip that one. For me, it's a difficult question. For a cold room, can you explain the standard requirements for establishing a cold room? What's the minimum number of residents required to have a cold room? This one, I, I'm going to guess it's based on volumes and the type of uh, cold chain that you require. Do you need a large freezer, a small freezer? Do you need a large room or is a, a, a more simple refrigerator um, adequate for your volume requirements? Um, I don't know, uh, Matt or Barbara, do you want to add? Really quickly, it, yes, it, it's more volume needs versus number of residents because the number of residents um, will get you started by understanding how many different vaccines you are using in the program. Um, and you know the, the presentations of the vaccines as well will dictate that volume need. Uh, there are great, you know, the, the resources that have been shared in this help understand that some of the things like the grossing factor to make sure there's enough airflow within the cold room, even though it's a, a 10 cubic meter cold room, right? We still only have a, a, a portion of that for actual storage space to make sure everything operates and stays cool. Um, but the, the, some of the, the Excel tools will definitely help under, map that. Um, and then things like the total cost of ownership tool can then help you compare, should I have eight large ILRs or a small cold room, et cetera. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Anything, Barbara? Yeah, thank you. Nothing for me. Okay, 
thanks. So I think we have maybe time for one last question. And I apologize that we have more than one. We can also try to answer additional questions during the follow-up email. Um, but the one that I'd like to look at, there's a question about obsolete equipment and functional life of the equipment. And so the question is basically, they have 10-year-old equipment that still functions. Should that be now considered obsolete because it's so old? Are there any recommendations for the replacement? My initial response to that is going to be, if the equipment is so old, are spare parts still going to be available? And if not, then you should start thinking about transitioning from the 10 year old equipment to the newer equipment where the spare parts are gonna be available. But I would probably say that just because a piece of equipment is 10 years old, doesn't mean you automatically throw it out on its 10th birthday. Matt, do you wanna to add to that or Barbara? No, I'm just to, I think this also brings up the importance of actually, you know, regularly reporting on the reliability of the uh, equipment, you know, just because it's 10 years old doesn't mean that, it, that it's not a, a good piece of equipment and therefore knowing which of which brands, which models are actually your reliable workhorses in the system, I think is very important. Um, and tracking you know whether the manufacturer is is continuing to produce that and as greg says has the spare parts i think that's important to know um just because it's new doesn't necessarily mean it's reliable i mean you know we, we are trying to track you know the value for cost um the value of the reliability per cost of the of the product as well so yeah thanks that's a great uh point to bring out matt do you want to add anything I think you know, both both of you kind of hit it on the head. If, if it's operating and, and you have the ability to maintain and continue operation, um, there, there's no reason to to necessarily retire it. You know, for cold chain planning, we assume a useful life, uh, operating life of t of ten years, and some equipment makes it well past that. Like like your example, um, while others are a challenge. And the the thing with the inventories is we're collecting data at least to get more of a, an empirical approach to say and evaluate which ones are performing well and, and which ones aren't. Um, so as, as long as we're, we're collecting the data, we can, we can explain these much better. Thanks. Okay, great. And just to draw quickly a parallel, I was just reading an article that the Boeing 747, which they're gonna be retiring, but they've been using those airplanes for over 30 years and they can <laughs> still maintain them and they still run perfectly fine. All right, so um, I apologize. We weren't able to address all the questions. We'll try to answer some others in the follow-up email. Again, you'll be receiving that follow-up email with the resources that we mentioned or referred to during the webinar. And it will also provide you links to previous webinars. I want to remind you that certificates of participation will be issued to those of you who have attended at least four of the five webinars in our series by March 1st either live or on demand. And we're now at the conclusion of our final webinar in the Ensuring a Responsive Immunization Supply Chain webinar series. We wanna take this opportunity to thank Gavi who provided the funding for the series. And we also want to mention and thank the various guest speakers who have participated in particular Matt who joined us today and I'd also like to thank Barbara. It's been great working with you for this series. It's really been a pleasure. And thank you, Greg, for working with me on this series. All right, great. And we wanna thank again, everyone for joining us, including anyone who wasn't with us today, but maybe you participated in one or more of the previous webinars and please do use the links to view uh, any webinars that you missed. We also hope to meet everyone again, perhaps in a future webinar series, and you'll get information on that as it's uh, available and as it's, uh, yeah, available. We wanna wish you continued success and also remind everyone to continue to participate in discussions on IAPHL and the Boost website that we've been talking about. We'll share that information again. They are both there for you as an ongoing resource and a forum to raise and discuss issues related to vaccine and immunization supply chain management and other logistics or supply chain related issues. Again, thanks very much. And everyone have a great day, have a great afternoon, have a great night.
Take care. Bye.